you don't want something to be said you record I'm also the um, the moderator the co-moderator of fossil free peace USA um, and on the executive committee of um, Presbyterian peace Fellowship. and yes. um, and I'm delighted that you're all here so um, that that um, Dennis, do you want to say any more about your um, Duke Energy stock? And introduce what tenants do I need to do this evening? <laughs> Please do 20 push-ups, no. Um, so um, tonight we're going to do a little bit about introductions and then um, kind of talk about how this conversation um, came to be. Um, we're going to dig into some of the problems with Board of Pensions um, and then begin to vision what the church can be with this, with its um, introductions um, and then dive into some next steps and begin to dig into the questions that we all have together. Um, I'm looking at your faces and, and remembering that so many of you have been in this conversation um, in a variety of different ways in the past seven years. And so our hope is that you'll jump in if um, you have wisdom you wanna share, or if you have questions that come up in the conversation. Um, so let's dive in. Um, and uh, Kate, you shared in the chat box that you're currently invested in both of the PCUSA socially responsible funds. Can you say a little, would you be willing to say a little bit more about which funds those are? Um, it's just, they're literally just named the PCUSA socially responsible fund. When you go to invest, like that's literally what they are called. And so you think that you're doing something good. <laughs> and in this process, I have learned maybe not. So. Yep. There you go. That's how they get you. That's how they get you. Yep. Um, and I think at some point, um, either either Dex or I will explain how, or maybe one of you will explain the, the different kinds of funds that the Board of Pension has. Um, but let's dive in. Um, Liz, tell us how we got here. Tell us your story. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Liz Carney. My pronouns are she, her, and uh, I'm a pastor in Southwest Washington State. Um, Dexter Carney, who's also on the line, he and I co-pastor a small PCSA congregation here on the border of Washington and Oregon together. And I'm just going to share briefly with you how Dexter and I got engaged in this conversation about how to um, challenge the Board of Pensions to change their investment strategies so that it matches our values as followers of Jesus. We both recently completed the Healthy Congregations, Healthy Pastors program through the Board of Pensions. I don't know how many folks are familiar with it, um, but essentially the Board of Pensions received a Lilly grant and then they've used, I think, also some of their own money from the Board of Pensions um, to supply pastors like me, like Dexter, like some of you others on this call, with ten, up to $10,000 that can either go to debt relief or can go straight into your retirement savings fund through uh, the Board of Pensions. Uh, it's an incredible program. It involves going through a series of training modules and training sessions online and on the phone, um, some personal, personal financial planning calls that are set up for you, um, learning more about how to negotiate terms of call. It was a really helpful process. So in one of the learning modules that we completed, we read that committed to justice, the church offers through the Board of Pensions benefits that combined with other elements of compensation provide security for our ministers and their families. Um, and in another module that was sort of trying to root us in the underlying theology of the Board of Pensions caring for their workers, this is another quote from some of the slides that I was reading. The Board of Pensions considers the provision of benefits to be holy work by caring for the bodies and souls of its employees 
and giving expression to the creative activity of the Trinitarian God to whom Holy Scripture bears witness. So I, I of course, have all this in my mind as we're entering into this learning about um, our own financial benefits through the Board of Pensions, um, which, by the way, I'm you know, I'm a, I'm a installed pastor, so I'm receiving my health insurance, uh, my pension that is accruing all through the Board of Pensions, in addition to um, Dexter and I are, all, are also both invested in the same two funds Kate was talking about, the, the only two socially responsible funds um, in our portfolio of choices. So I had all this in mind, and then through this process of the learning modules in this program, Dexter and I started looking more closely at what does socially responsible mean in these mutual funds in which all of our money is invested. Um, and like many of you, I imagine we chose those two funds when we set up our retirement savings plan because they were the only two that were labeled that way. Um, and we wanted something that reflected our values around justice and equity and um, caring for body and soul, as the Board of Pension states that it wants to do for its pastors. We want that for all employees that are laboring um, in companies that we benefit from those investments. And so as we started digging into this, what we found out, um, and perhaps many other people know this already, but this was new information to both of us, um, that one of those two socially responsible funds still invests in fossil fuel companies and a bank responsible for helping fund the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, you know, and then the other one is invested in alcohol, firearms, and tobacco production. Yay! Yay! <laughs> um, Wonderful. So, and then yeah, furthermore, both of these mutual funds are also invested in large tech companies, many of which... I personally boycott because I'm uncomfortable with how they value profit over their own employees. Um, and I'm sure that there's kind of some wiggle room for many people in thinking about their investments that way. But this was new information to us um, because I hadn't explored it before. I was realizing I should have explored it a long time ago. So that's where this process started in, in kind of Dexter and I learning about this. So I'm going to pass it off to Dexter now because he has been responsible for doing more of a deep dive in some of the investing practices of the Board of Pensions. So Dexter, you can take it away. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Uh, like Liz said, uh, we're pastors, co-pastors in Longview, Washington, a small Presbyterian church. And uh, we've only been pastors for four years. So we've, we've been taking this one step at a time and learning and we're just starting to get more engaged. And um, this is part of that work, we believe. Um, but as you probably have heard, you're required, if you're a pastor in the PCOSA, you are required to be enrolled in the Board of Pensions, G20804, for anyone who wants to check their references in the Book of Order, um, requires that you be invested in the pension plan. And on one hand, the pension plan is a sense of justice for our pastors in order to keep them safe in case of injury uh, upon retirement. But at the same time, there's no choice to be included in this plan. And there's no choice over what it invests in, at least not on a personal level. These pension investments of over $10 billion have several large fossil fuel investments, specifically Exxon, Valero, and Marathon. Um, these were three we were supposed to divest from at this most recent GA, but it was deemed non-essential business. And those were the, we weren't going to divest from fossil fuels. We were going to divest from those three companies, which means that other companies we would probably still be invested in. Um, so we don't have any choice in being invested in those institutions as well as many other problematic institutions like J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. We're also not just in the pension plan, but we're given the opportunity to set up a 403B plan through Fidelity, also known as the Retirement Savings Plan. Within this plan are a couple of socially responsible funds, and I use the air quotes because of what we've already talked about, is socially responsible covers all manner of sins if we just put it as a title. Um, 
currently, uh, because these do change, in the top 10 investments in our pension plan are JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, the banks I referenced that we're also investing in our uh, pension plan. These two institutions, like Liz said, support the Dakota Access Pipeline and other fossil fuels. Wells Fargo is the largest bank for gun makers in America and the largest bank for the NRA in America. Um, how is that socially responsible? So the socially responsible funds are supposed to take all of the prohibitive securities given by GA since 1970, and it's supposed to accumulate all of those and weed those out of our pensions and weed those out of the socially responsible funds. That's why fossil fuels are still in there is because we have not formally divested from them in any way. The Board of Pensions claims that it believes in justice but it also will tell you that it has a fiduciary responsibility to make as much money as possible for its shareholders. And that is an actual legal responsibility on pensions companies and investment companies to try to not intentionally cut short our retirement. However, fossil fuels are one of the worst performing sectors over the last 10 years. In fact, during this downturn from COVID-19, ESG funds, that means that they're screened for environmental concerns, social concerns, and governance concerns, how they govern uh, within themselves. These ESG funds actually outperformed most other funds. They've also been proven to perform at the same rate or uh, of other high-ranking funds, and they actually tend to outlast these other funds in terms of longevity. So not only are they socially responsible, they're actually more stable and at least as productive. The problem is the Board of Pensions does not take action based on individual concerns or moral concerns. They have a strict policy for making changes to their investment strategies. That policy states since 1972, I believe, that first, all screens or potential prohibitives, pr potential divestments must go through MRTI. That stands for Mission Responsibility Through Investing, which is a group, uh, uh, arm of the PCUSA. This group must first vet the organizations in question using a ranking system to determine how they fit our values. Then they're required to try and advocate to these organizations to change through shareholder advocacy. And then, and only then if the company does not change, MRTI, will recommend that GA vote and divest from those organizations. This takes time and effort, and it's really only left in the hands of a few people to really advocate for these changes. I'm now gonna pass it off to my friend, Jose, who's gonna paint us a picture of what our investments could look like. Jose? Thank you, Dexter, uh, and thank you, Liz. I think I think that was well well thought out and well presented. I, I just wanted to share some ideas. Uh, maybe like a, it doesn't. You don't have to take everything I have to say uh, as 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 a roadmap, but just ideas that might affect your context and where you are at. Uh, one of the things that I'm that I'm trying to, the first thing that I want us to, to take paint the picture of is that we're in a culture right now where the ethos is really about externalizing costs. And this already started through a process of what we call outsourcing. In a way, we were trying to, to get ourselves uh, off the burden of financial, uh, off the financial burdens by just, you know, uh, li liberating ourselves and, and then passing the cost out to some sort of transaction that the way we do it. So, but what that's turned out into a way of life now. So, the, the, the energy that we're consuming is really externalizing the cost to communities and societies elsewhere. And so this is something we, when we're talking about our ministries and our respective congregations, uh, I've always say that maybe what would happen if we were to green each of our congregations? And I wanted to start there. And the idea, the reason why we're doing it is because we want to get ourselves out of the ethos of externalizing the costs that we have. And there, there's, there's a whole list of of other possibilities for churches to really have serious conversations of what it means. You know, what, it, what does it mean to green our facilities? 
and to consider alternative uh, sources of fuels to keep our, our, our heating systems working uh, in the winter time or whatever other ways we, we, we get our hot water. Because at this point it's going to be, what we're doing right now is the, at the pace that we're consuming and our patterns and behaviors are starting to affect communities that are far away from us. But gradually these things are starting to come home as we speak. So uh, we have to understand that air is finite. The water is finite. And the quality of the land is also finite. So eventually over time, as we start stressing these things out, there's going to be, there are going to be less places and spaces to stress in order for us to keep our consumption levels going. So this is the agency of churches and congregations that we have. If we find ways that we can ally ourselves to each other and, and help each other uh, to resource things that we can do that really can change things. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the initiative of the Matthew 25 uh, initiative. Yeah. And there are a lot of great uh, principles that are there, but I, I find it very difficult. I'm going to find, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to find, we're going to find it very difficult to, for us to fight systemic racism, unless we deal with these environmental issues, because these things are really hitting home to most of the communities right now. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if you heard the address that was given by the Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin today. Uh, where he was mentioning some of these issues of a lot of a lot of people of color, of the communities of people of color across the United States are becoming places where they are uh, uh, frontline communities to a lot of the environmental hazards that are happening today. So part of the devastation that we're seeing a lot of communities, it's it's happening, and especially with indigenous communities of what we've been seeing uh, through through the last year or so uh, in, in the forms of protests and protections of the land. Now, I'm, a, I'm an aficionado for photography, but one of my favorite uh, environmental photographers uh, did a land tour through the Grand Canyon. And he was looking at some of the Navajo and Hopi communities that are being affected across the areas of the Grand Canyon, not just in the, in the access to the waters and that, that are affecting the, the Grand Canyon, but also the tourism and the consumption and the garbage that's being left behind. Uh, to these communities and how that's affecting them. Uh, there was also the development issues that they were trying to bring into these places. So we need to consider that the decisions that we make, even though it's, it's just a local issue in a local congregation, they do have public consequences. And so we need to start changing that ethos. But these also have implications for already things that we have in the program of the Presbyterian Church today. And so if you are considering um, to become a Matthew 25 church and there's some discernment going on in, in sessions or, in, or in, in other, any uh, worshiping community that you know of that wants to entertain the Matthew 25 uh, principles, then we need to take and put this into the, into the conversation. And that would be one way for us to really start looking at these things at a local level, but that has implications worldwide. One other point that I want to make, and I want to make two more points, but I'll try to be as brief as I can. But the second point that I want to bring to you is that as we change these things, we probably have ways of, uh, of, of, of fighting with one decision. It could also have implications for, for many other things in the way that I just alluded to a second ago. Meaning, as you're greening the church, you're also liberating yourselves from a lot of the issues of the racial tensions that are taking place in communities of, of color and poor people because they are frontline communities and they're already being affected. So you don't necessarily have to be on a march if, if it's too controversial for a lot of churches and sessions to discuss these things. Uh, you don't have to make a, so much of a public stand, uh, but it's just a simple action such as this, whereas if you decide to, to become a Matthew 25 church and say, well, we, we, we also are putting into our ethos the issue of greening our congregation, then what's going, we're, we're, but we're also aware of how this affects systemic racism, how this affects other communities, how this affects humanity, and how it affects creation. And these kinds of things also help us in, in making decisions. And so our decisions, if they have public consequences, they can also have uh, very positive ones. Lastly, You've heard these things about win-win uh, exchanges, right, or, or transactions of some sorts. They, most, most of the time, they're usually done from the standpoint of a demagoguery 
or maybe of someone trying to take advantage over a weaker party. But I do see here that there, there can be, with the limited time that we have on this earth, but we, there is a possibility for a win-win here. That as we start changing our, our ways of investing, the ways that we use our, our worship spaces, uh, and what kind of function, not only in terms of function, but in terms of consumption, and in the ways that the, the uses that we have, the materials that we have, the way we build things, and how we bring that into our, our, our church membership, that there can be a gain here that at the same time, while we're not just preserving creation, but that we're, we're also doing something that is doing good and it's missionally sound. If we can embody these kinds of things and give a public testimony about it. Uh, that's hard. That's a hard to sell, I think, so far. But I think the idea of trying to sell this as a win-win exchange in terms of how we make this decision and weigh out the, 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 the consequences of the decision. And I think there's something there for us to really hold on to. And to ask this question in a very heartfelt way, what kind of church do we want to be? What kind of legacy do we want to leave behind? Not just in money and financial resources, but in terms of our sacred spaces. Because if this is really a holy place, then how can we use it with materials that have done damage to other communities as well? If we built a worship space here, then what's it going with the materials that we have that have been taken away, plundered from someplace else, then something we're doing is, 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 is wrong because we cannot build a worship space at the expense of someone else. We read in the Bible uh, about the issue of Solomon building the temple and the controversies that were around it, particularly with the system of taxation that was breaking the, Deuteron the, the, the law in Deuteronomy, as we see that, right? It was raised in the Book of, uh, the book of Kings. And as we're looking at this, because there was, there was also part of the Torah was the, was the teaching that the means have to be on par with the ends. And as we speak about the great ends of the church, we also have to think of the great means of the church, right? And to bring this language and to, and to enrich our theological language, our practice, our mission, our, our hopes of what we're doing here, so when we're talking about something about the Board of Pensions, which is, I did all this tangent just to get us there, uh, which is basically that, that one of the reasons why people are reluctant to divest is because they don't see the connection. And as long as we start making these connections, I think this will make easier uh, the challenges that we're going to pose to the entities of the Presbyterian Church of which the, the uh, of the greater church, I should say, which includes the Board of Pensions that we can get ourselves to really say, well, we already did this. We already did some items. We've already greened our facilities. We've already ta tackled these things locally. We realize that then the financial issue will not be such a big, uh, heavy burden for a lot of sessions and communities, uh, worshiping communities to, to take on the next step. And, we, and I think so when we put these things in front of people to really see how they are interconnected and how we are all, all joined at the hip, so to speak, then maybe it will be a lot easier for us to make the leap and to put the pressure in a way that, that, that is thoughtful, that is imaginative, that, that can bring great benefits to our life, but also uh, establish connections in ways that we never thought we could do. So I think I went on that tangent just to share that with you. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. Um... Uh, I'm going to talk to us a little bit now about what we're hoping our sort of next steps can be. Uh, hopefully to have some tangible action that we can actually take as we um, continue to put on pressure. Sadly, this is not a one-time thing. This is, as so many of you involved, especially in the fossil fuel divestment, know this has been ongoing for too long um, and delayed again and again. But uh, it's the system we're in and it's the system we have to make work for us. Um, Board of Pensions does not give us much hope in terms of affecting change on a grassroots level from individual engagement, from advocacy as members. Uh, I, I've constantly been told from different agencies uh, that someone else is responsible and it keeps moving. It's a moving target, which is really frustrating. Um, or they'll say, we can't do anything without a GA directive. Um, 
However, I think there are some steps we can take. The first thing we would like to do um, uh, I think we're going to take a second and stop and just sort of check in, see where everyone's at. Uh, I do have some ideas about what we can do. I have uh, some funds we can look at from what Kate's question was. Uh, but let's, we've dumped a lot of information on you, and uh, I've been chewing and swimming this nonstop for quite a while. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a stop and just say, are there any questions about what we've done so far? Um, or do you want me to just keep going and keep dumping the information on you? Dexter, can you just say that the different options in Board of Pensions that people who are ordained um, might already find themselves in currently? Because I think it's a little bit confusing. Yes. So you're required to be in the pensions plan. Everyone is in that. We don't have any say on what those investments are or include or don't include. Uh, and those really do require GA directives to change. Um, well, supposedly. Uh, that's the party line. That's what they tell us. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But they tell us that that has to go through GA directives. There's the optional 403B plan, which is an add-on that you can invest in um, for your personal retirement savings. Uh, you can get a match through your church if they're willing to do that. Um, and so this, there's some more flexibility with. There's currently the two socially responsible funds in there. One's a more bond related and one's more stock related, but uh, they're actually basically the same in terms of what they invest. They recently added what's called the PAX Global Fund. This is a fund that works to be greener and to remove fossil fuels. Um, however, it doesn't have any of the other screens that the PCUSA currently has. Uh, no military, uh, some restrictions on Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, no alcohol, tobacco, firearms. There's no restrictions on the PAX Global. Uh, I, I don't know all of their restrictions, but they don't have all of that there. Um, so what I've done is I worked with Fidelity and some outside investors. And I looked at every single one of Fidelity's ESG funds. There's 127 of them. I took out the five and four Morningstar ratings. So that means they're the highest rated by capitalists, uh, meaning they, they tend to perform well. Um, I then cross-referenced all of those with what's called the heart rating which is an additional system created by naturalinvestments.com that looks at how they invest in communities, looks at their different shareholder advocacy. Um, and it's not a perfect system, um, but basically I took that. And so now I've got the top ranking Morningstar, the top ranking heart funds. And then I ran all of those through fossilfreefunds.org, which rates uh, everything on an A to F grade about how well they're investing or not investing in fossil fuels, A, for not investing, for having a zero carbon footprint, for investing in green energy. Uh, and believe it or not, none of the investments peaked in all three categories. Um, <laughs> but I found seven that uh, peaked in two and only got one grade down on the third. Um, so either it was, uh, not perform as high, not as socially responsible, or not as fossil independent. But there's some decent funds. Um, so what I did with those, uh, I've really been diving into this, trust me. And if I'm boring you, please stop me. Uh, I took those seven funds and I looked at what their top 10 holdings are um, for the last year. And um, I then researched those companies to see how they actually did. Uh, the first one I found, uh, was heavily invested in Nestle, which has a history of using uh, slaves to uh, harvest their chocolate. So that one went right out. Um, <laughs> and I've got it basically down to two. And my hope is that the group of us, and we, hopefully we can bring more, can ask Board of Pensions to add these to our 403B plan. 
Um, for those who are interested, they're called the Calvert Small Cap Fund and the Eventide Gilead class. I'll put that in the chat. Um, and they, I found that they were the best performing and the most ethically responsible and even did some of my own digging to try and find it. However, Board of Pensions doesn't have to put that in there for you, but there is a way around Board of Pensions. Uh, I recommend calling Fidelity and asking them. Hold on, how, many, how much of this is confusing so far? I'm sorry, I'm so deep in it, I can't tell when I'm. <laughs> Dexter and I have spent a lot of time thinking about this. So how many of you are like, wait, what are we talking about? Sorry. It's okay, Charles is okay. Dennis is good. Okay. Okay, we're good, we're good, we're good. Okay, great. Go ahead, Dexter. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I really am sorry if I'm, no, no. I've been eating, sure. drinking, and breathing this, and it's... Uh, Actually, Dexter, you're doing the Board of Pensions a favor because they should be explaining this to us anyway. Well, they have, they, have, they have staff that should be doing this, as well as MRTI should be the ones doing this research, but here I am. Um, well, so. and if... Go ahead, Abby. No, I was going to say, uh, you actually can ask them all of this, and they will tell you this, but they won't tell you that the two socially responsible funds are not overlapping. You have to know that you need to ask that those are not overlapping. Does that make sense? Like, okay, continue. I'm putting into the chat the simplest form that I can tell you of how to actually move your funds over there. Basically, you go to Fidelity's website, their net benefits website, you find a link under something and it says brokerage link. You click on that and that allows you to opt out of the 27 funds that Board of Pensions has uh, classified and then you're open to all of Fidelity's funds. Uh, so you can invest however you want if you wanna do more research. The two funds, I gave you the five letter link there. Um, if you trust me, you don't know me that well and just met me, but uh, I, hopefully you could tell my heart's in it. Uh, these are the two best funds that I found. Um, they're both pretty well performing. Um, I have found that the smaller, what they call small cap or small blend funds tend to invest in smaller companies, um, whereas large cap or mid cap invest in middle or large. I'm not exactly sure what the designation is, because to be a stock, you still have to be a publicly traded company. So you're pretty big already. Um, but you can all, if you want to tonight, move your funds out of the socially responsible or PACs or the Fidelity 25 or Fidelity 60 or whatever the different funds are and move them over there if you want. Um, I don't believe there's a fee assessed, uh, but don't quote me on that. Um, and also this took me a couple hours with Fidelity on the phone. Uh, so you might also just have to call them to help. But I was told that because it's still through Fidelity, it can still be the 403B, the church can still match it. It still fits all of those criteria. Um, it's just sort of an optional link to open up your fund options. Um, I've, I've asked their, the board of pensions, I've asked their investment team and uh, their CEO, if they could add these to our, um, to our options. And I've been getting the runaround, but I would encourage all of us, and hopefully we're gonna send a follow-up email about how we can all encourage them to include these funds because it's a simple process for them to just transfer it over. Um, so, so that's the ask, right? The ask for all of you is to yes. not just look at if you're invested in the board of pensions, but for all of you to call board of pensions and ask for these two options to be options for all the pa for all pastors invested in all pension uh, and 403B um, members who are not just pastors. Um, yeah, and I view that, that as the like stop the immediate bleeding. <laughs> you know, like I I think that, that we're talking about like very very long range 
work. That's some of what Jose was getting at and like others on this call have been getting at. That's very, very long work that we all need to be very committed to. This is sort of like a tourniquet <laughs> to like help us immediately in a, in a more um, quick sense, find some way to actually move a bunch of money um, into something more responsible. So do y'all have any questions? Well, I appreciate okay. what Dexter has been saying about moving funds and, and I've tried to do that with uh, our investments. I'm no longer in the Board of Pensions. I never was in the Board of Pensions and that's a whole long story. Um, but my investment broker has tried to keep money in socially and yet I get the runaround too. Well. You know, you're, you're, you're not in fossil fuels, but you're in airplanes that drop bombs. <laughs> and I yeah. use that example all the time, but there are other, other issues. And, and it's hard. I just got a message from BlackRock. And guess where a lot of my money is controlled by BlackRock? Well, they're doing some bad things. And uh, so, but they're, they also promise to be socially responsible. So like you said, Dexter, you know, the promise comes out of one side of their mouth, but the action comes out of the other side. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you for helping us get through this. And I would appreciate it in some kind of an email or written form, whether Abby can do that or you can send it out to us. That would be helpful. And then we can get it out to our presbytery. I'll stick on, get, jump on Paul, who's in our presbytery and, uh, and make sure that it gets out uh, to Northwest Coast. And Liz, it's nice to have you in the state of Washington, but you're almost out of it way down there in the south. We're up in a beautiful Puget Sound area. That's right. <laughs> okay, so I do have some questions. Well, yeah. maybe it's more of a question. Um, and Dexter, I know, and Liz, we've all kind of bounced ideas off of each other <laughs> as we were all figuring all of this out. But um, so I guess what I'm hearing is short term, we are being asked to not only change our own, our personal funds that we're invested in, you know, if we have the 401 or the 403B optional fund, right? We're being asked to move those and to write the board of pensions um, and say, these are the companies that we should be investing in. Is the ultimate push to have these, these be or find more socially responsible funds that are then what everything is invested in for the PCUSA, like the like everything instead of. I'm not good with this type yeah, of stuff. No, totally. That's exactly our goal. <laughs> the goal okay. is to start with something that's manageable, you know, bite right. off this chunk try and get some people interested, build up a sort of power base of people interested in this. Then if they say yes to us, fantastic, we're winning. Let's take that momentum and move forward. Or they say no to us, now we're angry and we have momentum and we move forward. <laughs> uh, so the second step, uh, and this would be sort of down the road, um, well, not down the road that far, but is to, is sort of a two-pronged attack. <laughs> uh, a two-pronged I don't like using violent language. Uh, a two-pronged moving forward. Um, one, getting our presbyteries to write overtures to GA um, that move us towards divestment of fossil fuels as well as other ethical funding sources that we want to include. The second is to pressure MRTI to start investigating those companies now to start looking into the, the JP Morgan and Wells Fargo. And actually they're already looking into both of them. Um, and they, I, I'll give this to MRTI. They have had some success in the past of pushing companies to change, uh, but many companies don't, or it's a slow faucet or, um, so if we are wanting to actually divest, it requires the GA vote and MRTI. So if we push both of those forward at the same time, we don't in 2022 have a 
vote, then it goes to MRTI, and then it comes back to GA again. This way, we're at least moving both balls forward at the same time, if that makes sense. The, the Board of Pensions policy is that it has to be MRTI and then GA, and MRTI will tell you that they have to have GA directives in order to move, which uh, one is not true. I read their bylaws today. Um, and two, we've made so many statements as a PCUSA about poverty or the environment or anything about that, that there's plenty of backlogs in our <laughs> GA overtures that we could, I mean, we signed, we affirmed J. Herbert Nelson signing the Poor People's Campaign, which has a huge list of agenda items that would easily translate into not supporting certain banks or et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's, that's part of the, the point that I was trying to make about externalizing costs, because what we're doing is, right? That, that's, that's part of the ethos right there that I was trying to get at. Um, maybe I didn't share it that, uh, that, that good, but, no, that's great. but, but I, 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 what's interesting about this is that this is the culture of Wall Street. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm born and raised in New York, so Wall Street has always been in our backyard. And the people that work at Wall Street, you know, um, uh, for all the stuff that we talk about, gang fights and, you know, inner city poverty, but there's also these are the people who are the real gangsters in some ways, the way in terms of the way they behave, um, which is why it's important for us to start changing these conversations with with our local with our local worshiping communities, mm -hmm. um, because otherwise it will be difficult to to push another overture, right? Because they, to get a presbytery to agree on it, the, unless these conversations are already happening, um, and this is the reason why we need to really like. Uh, start simmering the, 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 the pot from below so that, you know, these things start to percolate up eventually. Um, because if we change the conversation, then over time that we can get to where we want to put the, the, the adequate pressure that's there. I know it's frustrating, for instance, to get the Board of Pensions to change our, you know, our investment instruments there. But enough people are doing it, they have no choice but to start doing it themselves, you know, because, uh, it, what's interesting is that five years ago, there would not have been these options didn't exist. So now we have these options exist because people have been asking the questions. That's true. So what's going to happen in the next five years? Well, we need to keep doing, pushing it until they, they make it part of the policy and the identity. Because what we really want to get at, which is really subversive, is to change the identity of, of, of the Board of Pensions and the Presbyterian Church. And, and you know, so we need to keep pushing and percolating and boiling the pot until we get until we get that thing bubbling. Okay, so that's my second question. Uh, Jose, you bring up a very good point, but I'm wondering if um, like as we start to look at this as a more long term um, struggle mm -hmm. and trying to I mean, because I know like as Liz mentioned, the fossil fuel divestment has taken how many GAs now? It feels like it's been quite some time. Um, four, four GAs. I mean, so eight years, um, and we're still not done. I guess I'm, I'm wondering, are there, are there ways, um, or is there someone that, or as maybe as a committee, I guess, if this is something that's going to move forward, that we can keep like as new companies come onto the scene, I'm guessing in the stock market that maybe are more socially responsible, you know, that we can keep track of them and know, well, well, that's even better than one of the two options that Dexter gave us. So can we, you know, move there? Um, is there any process, I guess, for, or has that well, been thought I, of, of how we're going to track all those things? I, I think one doesn't exclude the other, uh, to, to the short answer. But the, the issue is this. Let's assume that we get everything we wanted. We get MRTI to agree. We get, the, we get the, the General Assembly to agree. Do you know that most of our congregations are still vested in the fossil fuel in terms of our consumption rates? Right? So uh, that's what I'm saying. We need to see this as, as a multi-pronged strategy, uh, that these things are holistic. And I would say, I would like to use the word holistic. Um, because we could get we could get our portfolios out, but as long as our our consumption habits in the churches are still there, 
chances are then it's, going, it's still going to be the uphill battle, even if we got what we wanted today. So I think this is something one doesn't preclude the other. And, and we, we're, we're doing this together. Right, and I think this over time is going to create create a, a sense of togetherness that maybe right now we don't have it, but I think we will gradually snowball to where we we, we have something. That if we don't get one hundred percent of it, I think I'll even take twenty percent success on this. Okay, and don't and don't feel bad even if it's just twenty percent because I think to to we're talking about moving a, a big institution. It, it's not any. It's not easy. I, I just don't want to make this. Uh, we come from a generation where we come from generations where we've been used to having the things our way as ASAP, right? And this is not Burger King; you can't have it your way. So, <laughs> so we really, <laughs> uh, we really need to, we really need to think that this is a grind. And I and I want us to, you know, it's 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 frustrating, yes, but I think it's the most hopeful thing that we could do. I think it's very hopeful. And again, this could be win-win. Over time, it's win-win because we are gaining traction. Um, the fact that we are, I remember we were on the march. I remember saying this to the fellow marchers. Listen, don't be frustrated if we don't get what we wanted. And we were this close because we were by a hair. And it, all it took was some, was some, was some uh, substitute motion to change the whole thing. We lost on a parliamentary procedure. The march for fossil fuel divestment. Right. So one of the things that I want to just stick in here is one of the questions that somebody submitted was if there's an, uh, other denominations or faith institutions that have like figured out a fully socially responsible um, investment option. And um, part of my background is that I'm writing my dissertation in all of this. So again, oh, you don't have to... Um, um, Believe me, please feel free to do your own research. Um, but that's like my credential on this. Um, there is no institution that I can tell that has like, that's faith-based and is totally um, socially responsible in terms of denominations. Um, institutions like the United Church of Christ have supported divestment from fossil fuels, but their polity doesn't let them like decide for the whole denomination about their investments. Um, the Episcopal Church voted in favor of um, fossil fuels, for example, but their polity when doesn't connect their um, like Pensions. general assembly votes to their um, those are not connected. Um, and there is no other denomination in the U.S. that. Um, <clears throat> has really supported uh, like this kind of thing, right? And I use that just as an example to say like, they're not divested from fossil fuels. It's a hard, uh, everything else is pretty hard. Um, but what I will say is that because the Presbyterian church um, has the polity that we have and because we've been in this, the struggle for so long, um, what we have gained ha are like actual wins, right? So like the, we've pushed Board of Pensions to provide a fossil fuel option that actually exists um, and is actually an option. Um, so our inching is, is real, they are real wins. Um, and I don't mean that to be anti-UCC or Episcopal Church, their polity is their polity, right? Um, we're not divested either, so. <laughs> like, I'm not throwing stones uh, except for my glass house. So, um, uh, so like, there's nobody that's like really figured it out and is perfect, which I think actually is an invitation for us to be in the struggle and and work towards that. I want to. Paul asked a question in the chat. Um, he said, "If the divestment overture had passed at the last GA, would that have changed the landscape with regard to BOP and the 403B options?" So that divestment overture would have divested from three companies: Exxon, Valero. The, the overture called for a different overture. No, so the so the overture. I won't answer this question, Abby. You want to answer this question? <laughs> so the, over, if the overture passed. It would have. Um, it's recommended to Board of Pensions that we divest from the entire um, industry, the whole fossil fuel industry. MRTI, the investment committee, said um, that we're recommending divestment from 
um, Bolero, Exxon, and Marathon. So the church was going to have the option between the whole industry or the, the three companies. Um, uh, and what we know based on what Board of Pensions has said, both publicly um, on the floor plenary and um, then more publicly in like their, their email um, communications with their members, like publicly, um, has, has been uh, that while it was not their practice to necessarily follow General Assembly um, vote um, up until 2018, post General Assembly in 2018, they changed their policies to be in line with General Assembly. Um, if I might say, um, in response to general outcry from when they said they didn't have to do what uh, we had, what, what the General Assembly voted for, um, which I think says something about Board of Pensions willingness to listen to the church. Um, and I think also says, uh, in a positive way, and I think also the, um, it says something about the, the general power we have when we say to the Board of Pensions, we want you to change. And if that, if so if that divestment overture had passed, what it would have done is added a prohibitive screen to all of their investments that they would have had, I think they give themselves like a year to fully divest. Uh, and if a, brand, if a fund manager decides that it's not possible, they can appeal that to the board. Um, I was told that's never happened before, but apparently it's a possibility. Um, but then that screen would have been added and it would have changed Board of Pensions and 403B so that I would have changed the Board of Pensions so that they could not be invested in fossil fuels and the 403B socially responsible funds could not be. Any more uh, questions? Oops. All right. Final question before, and then I'll hush because I know I've asked a lot tonight. Um, but if this is something that not only are we gonna, that we not only want to work on in our own congregations, but at our presbytery levels, um, can uh, we lean on you all? And like, I mean, would folks be willing to like call in to Presbytery and say, you know, this is, and, and give, I guess, give a presentation on, on this so that pastors are aware um, and, and all others invested are, are aware. I think there's a handful of us who'd be willing to, to work on that. Uh, I know that uh, Presbyterian Peace Fellowship also <laughs> had a, <laughs> uh, they had a teach in two weeks ago about how to talk to your presbytery about it. And there's some information from that, that I can, I can forward to you, Kate, as well. <laughs> so, um, Dex made a, made reference to the fact that we're going to be following up to, from this, call and to everybody who registered um, with um, a script and written instructions for how to do the things that we've suggested um, and and um, and that will also give you um, our contact information as well um, and so that's kind of the next step um, I would also say that this is a good opportunity to, if, if anyone on this call is feeling like you'd like to be more active, sorry, our cat is being <laughs> very vocal. Um, anyone's interested in being more involved in helping to organize or getting more engaged in this, I think, uh, you know, Dex and I are so new to this, but um, really wanting, hungry to form like a, a community to do this together. Um, which is what this call is all about. And I think also it's a good opportunity to, we're recording this webinar, webinar, teach-in. Um, it's a good opportunity to think about who are especially members of the Board of Pensions, people who have an a active investment in the Board of Pensions to say, who else can I 
pass this on to and personally get them engaged because I think that kind of personal invitation and personal engagement is what will help um, to spread this into more Presbyterians and then you don't know who that person is connected to in the Presbyterian church. Um, and calling on our, you know, the folks we know who are higher up the chain than we are. Um, I think that that's part of the, the call too. And one more, thing, one more thing on the political note. Um, watch who rolls out of the board of trustees of the board of pensions that we could also send nominees from our respective uh, presbyteries and communities because we do have some very financially savvy people who work in high finance at, at, at all levels and they, they all, they're also very conscious about what's happening with the environment and let's throw some names in and let's not be afraid of putting those people you know front center uh, to serve in a, in a bigger in a bigger way And just to reiterate what Abby said, it's important that we, and Dexter, that we have this conversation and Liz were together. What is there, 15 on the screen or 20 of us who have been together before, but it's also helpful to have the written information that you can provide us because, you know, the screen closes down, we forget oh, what did uh, Jose say, what did Katie ask, um, so having some of it written and some guidelines is helpful. Great. So friends, thanks for joining us tonight or this afternoon, wherever you're calling from. Um, as we close, let's pray um, because at the end of the day, we are who we are because God calls us and uh, makes us and loves us. So let's pray. God of creation, God of all that is, we thank you for the, the trust you place in us and the call to put our hearts into the world and to make the world a more just and loving place. Give us courage, give us passion, and give us an eye for details as we grow and learn and work for justice. Let your Holy Spirit blow and may we be like Christ in the world. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Abby, for getting us all together. Thank you, Dick. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Dex. Awesome. Awesome. Big stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.